Great. Um, hello, and welcome to MobLab Live. My name is Aprajita, and I'm very excited to have you join us for uh, the seventh conversation of 2018 series. As, as you're joining from different parts of the world, please feel free to introduce yourself on the YouTube chat room, um, which must be on your screen, bottom right or top right. Um, your name, where are you from, your organization? I'm honored. I'm also honored to um, welcome and introduce a great panel um, with us who will be talking about distributed organizing. I welcome Landry, who is from 350.org, and he's the regional team lead there and trying to create a huge regional climate movement um, working in the organization. We have Cecily Thompson, who is the director at Beyond the Bomb and who's mobilizing organizers and campaigners against the threat of nuclear war and weapons. And Mary Ellis Krim, who is the field director at Free Press, working on ongoing policy initiatives um, with her most re recent efforts at um, net neutrality campaign in the US. A very, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And to Michael from the Mobile team, who will be hosting and moderating this session. I hope. You all have tuned in by now and we'll be doing that in a couple of minutes. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that um, the flow of the session is um, clear. Uh, we will be talking to the speakers in the first 45 minutes and the last 15 minutes are, is the time where we'll be taking questions um, from the audience. So if you have any questions, thoughts, reflections, any other examples and links of distributed organizing that you want to share with us, please share that on the chat room, as well as um, tweet us using the hashtag MobLabLive. Um, yes, so I invite you, Michael, to take us uh, forward um, to talk about how to lead uh, the campaigns using distributed organizing model. Thanks, Aprajita, and uh, yeah, another welcome to everyone joining. This is this topic is near and dear to my heart. I know um, some of us may think about distributed organizing as kind of a new, cutting edge uh, tactic or strategy, or perhaps both. Um, and that 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 is what we're all about here at the Mobilization Lab is helping campaigners um, at social change organizations stay at the cutting edge of effective modern day campaigning. And uh, my first job actually over, gosh, I don't know how many years ago now, but in 2004 was actually doing some work like this. So I, um, I have really enjoyed getting to see uh, different projects, different um, distributed organizing campaigning efforts take root um, and yeah, I got a, I, so, and yeah, like I said, my first, my first gig was trying to uh, wrangle and support this emergent energy of distributed, of individual activists and volunteers and campaigners on the Howard Dean campaign all across the United States and around the world. And um, was personally amazed to see what power and potential people could have when they put all their resources and energy into being part of something larger than themselves. And thanks to the internet, being able to connect across boundaries and location to um, do community work, but at scale and in a way that could then create a much louder, more powerful, resounding impact because it was happening in this new connected way and could be, and we could learn from each other across different locations more quickly. And, um, and very quickly after that, um, I'm, I'm so glad one of our guests is here from 350. Got to see the first global day of action, um, the largest day of political action in history, I guess, in, was it 2009, Landry? Um, we'll, we'll hear more about that. But two, just two, two, or two examples early in my career and which have really shaped me in understanding how a small group of people, in this case with 350, only a few dozen students, uh, not even uh, could help catalyze a global day of action um, that, uh, Large, many larger international NGOs um, perhaps could not. So um, I'm very excited about this topic. Um, and I think we'll hear some, some examples throughout today of what it means when um, certain smaller investments of staff or resources or energy can have outsized impacts on a, on a mission. So I, I'm eager to explore that with our 
with our guests, and hopefully you all are as well. As a project I invited you earlier, we, we are keeping an eye on the chat room and on the hashtag on Twitter. So, and my job here is to really uh, facilitate your questions and make sure we get those into the mix of this conversation. So, with that, um, another another welcome, and I'd love to. Uh, let's just start with. We'll go deeper with everyone here, um, but let's just start by hearing about the a little bit more about the kinds of projects and organizations we have represented uh, in, in, in today's discussion. And um, yeah, maybe Mary Alice, kick us off. Can you just tell us, give us a few words about what, what's Team Internet and um, you know, what, what's, what's the mission and what kind of, what are the kind of exciting, what, what's the distributed organizing model um, you've been working with at Free Press? Sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Uh, again, I'm Mary Alice Krim with Free Press and Free Press Action. And at our organization, we fight for everyone's rights to connect and communicate. And we do that work through media policies and technology policies like net neutrality, which is the policy and campaign that Team Internet was focused around. And our whole theory is that when people are organized around the US, they can put pressure on people in Washington, DC, on our representatives to make the media and communications policies that our communities want and need. And our organization was created to give people a voice in the crucial uh, media and communications decisions that shape our media system. So we really believe that communications should be used to connect us, um, not to silence us, not to divide us, and not to harm us. Uh, we really are looking for a media system that is used to liberate, not oppress. And um, when it comes to our future of our media system, we're really reaching for a media that is racially diverse and that rejects white nationalism and white supremacy. So a little bit about Team Internet. So in the summer of 2017, Free Press Action joined together with two other organizations, Demand Progress and Fight for the Future. So shout out to our allies and partners there. And we uh, asked a bunch of people to sign up to volunteer on net neutrality where they live. And I can give you more of that story later. But the end result was more than 500,000 volunteers signed up. And we thought, oh my gosh, what do we do? This is exciting. This is amazing. This is challenging. Uh, so we got to work right away. We organized them into working groups. And our goal was to um, get as much constituent contact as possible with our representatives who go to Washington, D.C., and we're going to be voting on this critical issue of net neutrality. Um, we were also really interested in harnessing the power of all of these volunteers and, and welcoming them and engaging them in our work. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll, we obviously will want to come back and hear hear more about all that. Um, Laundry, can you give us also a sense of, uh, you know, 350, I guess, has been around for over a decade now. So you have, maybe we can, we'll hear more about the evolution over time. But what, what does it look like now? Um, what are the nature? What is 350? What's, what are you working towards? Um, and, and how do the, give us a, a thumbnail or a look at what, how the groups and chapters and people participating in these global days of action, uh, what role do they play? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, greetings to all um, our, our audience. So 350 basically, as you said, uh, we've been organizing, mobilizing and um, campaigning for over 10 years now. Uh, we work with found, you know, found thousands of volunteer groups and organizers across the globe uh, to develop online campaigns, grassroots organizing, and mass public action to oppose and challenge new coal oil gas projects uh, that are developing in you know, global north, global south, basically all over the planet where we have groups of volunteers happy to take on that action. We also push to uh, take money out of this, you know, fossil fuel companies that are heating up our planet and you know, then uh, to do what to build 100% clean uh, energy solutions. So basically our, um, uh, theory of change um, covers uh, three key points because we believe that by keeping uh, all fossil fuel uh, in the ground, uh, we can uh, help build a new, more equitable uh, zero carbon economy. And also at um, um, where we are, we are based, including myself. I put myself as a part of the movement. Though we have staff, we also <laughs> right. sometimes involve 
uh, involved in the in the campaign going on want to build this kind of local and you know uh, this pressure at local and central level uh, pressing the government to uh, limit emissions so we are building uh, a people power movement basically because we believe that by doing so we'll be able to confront uh, the current um, uh, crisis, climate crisis that we, we are all living in. And we can only do so by getting connected to more people and using online, offline technology uh, that are suited to different regions and areas where we are based. Thanks, Landry. Um, Cecily, what Give us, uh, you're obviously Beyond the Bomb is a newer organization um, that you are leading. And what's the nature of, tell us again to, as well, your mission, what are you setting out to do and what role do the, we've seen the map on your, I'm just looking at the map on your website, what are the, those, the, the groups and chapters, how do, you, how do you refer to them and what role do they play in the mission? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me here. Um, so Beyond the Bomb, similar to what you've heard from the other uh, groups, is a people power campaign. So our main goal is to build a planet that's free from nuclear violence. So uh, lots of pressure there. Um, and I think fundamentally we believe that we can no longer cede nuclear policy and authority to just a handful of people. Um, it's really about taking that power back from you know one person who can essentially destroy life on Earth as we know it and give that back to the public. Um, so our theory of change is essentially that if we build and mobilize significant constituencies around the country in really key mm -hmm. targeted districts, um, that will have the power to uh, secure really courageous and bold action from legislators at the state and federal level. Um, and essentially, this has been an issue that is hard for um, a number of legislators to feel comfortable working on for a number of reasons. One, you know, in the, in the U.S., the progressive space typically does not include a lot of foreign policy. And this falls squarely in that area. And so we have a lot of folks that on a values basis would be aligned but aren't comfortable taking bold action because it's just not an area that they don't want to work in. And then otherwise, we have folks who just don't want to seem weak on foreign policy or on um, nuclear weapons. Um, and so our theory is that the best way to get them engaged and get them to become champions is to give them political cover to do so. So that's what our uh, our mobilization is all about, and that's where it becomes really crucial that the folks that we're engaging and are working in their communities are doing that in a in a way that they feel leadership and they feel motivation, um, so that there's authentic connection between the communities and those legislators. Um, so our, our next upcoming goal is to pass legislation uh, on no first use, which essentially would mean the U.S. Uh, in particular wouldn't launch a first nuclear strike. Um, and so for that. This is a big change in our policy, right? So we need to have champions who are really confident about it. Um, so we are using distributed organizing across the country, and as you said, we're relatively new. And so what we're doing is building that as we go as part of the, the backbone of the organization, our strategies. Um, at the chapter level, so as you noted, we have chapters all around the country. Um, we also have what we call action core leaders who are volunteers that are trained to um, help guide chapters in their communities and help guide other activists. And then we have a full list that's online of, of clicks events. And so it's, it's about how do we bring those two things together and leverage both the online and the offline um, power that we have where we need it at any given time. Great. Well, I, you know, I'd love to add just a bit more color, and maybe we can we can start with you, Sessa. Like you you kind of alluded to some of the activities. You've all touched on some of the activities that um, that the individuals who are part of this program, volunteers. Um, we'll take part in. Can you give us, a, you know, a, like a story or one of your favorite, I don't know, stories or visuals of of what what people are doing um, just to ground this all for, I, I think there's so many different flavors of distributed organizing and you've all touched on political power and this organizing and potential and um, at least that we see now in these programs. And um, yeah, give us one of your more inspiring uh, stories because since we all need a little bit of, of hope these days. Um, Cecily, do you want to, we'll, maybe we'll go back in, in reverse order here. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, so we have a pretty fresh story, which is exciting as a newer campaign. Um, we recently, um, Beyond the Bomb and a number of our coalition partners in California were able to pass the first piece of state-level legislation that urges Congress to change the 
nuclear policies. Hmm. Um, so essentially, it's the first state resolution of its kind, and we're pushing the resolutions all around the country for the very reason we were talking about, to build up that power right. and that interest on the ground. In California, we had um, a number of volunteer leaders who became excited about this opportunity and started to organize in their communities, really looking at how they could get folks excited, how they could build energy, and very importantly, find a sponsor for the state aid resolution. So in the end, the sponsor that ended up taking it across the finish line, the legislator, um, did so because it was her constituents that were coming to her and asking for this, uh, not us, right? It was not a national organization. It was people that vote for her or not, um, and that made a huge difference. And then their energy in organizing lobby days and working with our field organizer out there um, to, to you know, learn about the topic, learn about how to talk about it, understand organizing models and how to get people excited, uh, and then turn them out for lobby days and join with our online efforts where we organized phone calls into the legislators and so forth. Um, it was a great success, right? And so now we have not only a piece of model legislation, but we have activists who have gone through that process and are really excited about seeing the way in which their actions have direct impact um, that we're now able to sort of case study that into other states. Right, I can I can imagine that being very motivating, seeing one someone having success in one part of the network. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nothing like a little victory to motivate. Um, Laundry, how what, you must you probably are sitting on thousands of great examples and inspiring examples. Uh, I'll maybe share quickly two of them. Okay, um, great. Right. Um, um, a kind of old one and the recent one. Let's start with the old one. Back Perfect. in uh, two, uh, 2009, uh, a few months after the, you know, myself and a few uh, volunteers, organizers from different uh, uh, African countries were uh, went into um, an intense training or into campaigning and organizing. So we went back in our respective countries and communities to organize the first uh, global, uh, you know, global day of action. Uh, on climate, which was uh, organized six weeks before the Copenhagen summit. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have a, you know, a souvenir of uh, my colleagues from Ethiopia, actually two sisters who were you know, organizers, volunteers, uh, who uh, managed to bring in the streets of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 15,000 people. Uh, wow. in, in in Addis, as uh, actually was that was one of the massive mobilizations that we've ever seen in Africa. Knowing all the complexities and the challenges and the political restriction that are you know in some countries to be able to mobilize uh, such a huge amount of people uh, coming the street to uh, demand um, leaders to take uh, quick uh, mm -hmm. action that was ahead of the um, uh, the Copenhagen summit. A recent one, um, a couple of weeks ago, with the rise for climate. Uh, uh, the, uh, which is organized on uh, the 8th of uh, September uh, last month. Uh, we also had um, other, um, another organizer uh, from, from Uganda who normally works with schools, um, uh, primary, secondary. Uh, he also, and he brought on some artists as well and managed to um, um, mobilize approximately 25,000 uh, people in the um, uh, in one of the you know biggest square wow. of Kampala, Uganda. Uh, so and with very limited resources, uh, uh, but just using some of the um, uh, the tools that we've shared previously, and managed to really bring such incredible uh, you know a number of people in the street to mobilize again uh, for the need for you know keeping fossil fuels on the ground and reclaim and ask that the government uh, take on um, serious effort uh, to introduce renewable energy as part of the development agenda. So those are some of the two examples, and I think I'll get a chance to speak about more, but it, it shows the incredible um, um, uh, potential and possibility which is out there, which is offered by internet connectivity and the resources and the tools that can help uh, um, individuals and communities, including the most remote areas or the most difficult ones to organize, but uh, you know that can still do some amazing work. And if I can just ask a quick follow-up question there, since you mentioned you were involved in, well, first of all, just a, a quick observation of the amazing time we're in. I think when you were in Addis organizing that first day of action, I was in, I, I think I saw your photo in while I was in Times Square in New York City as some, several of the photos were coming in, but 
positive ones. And I think it's just a remarkable time that we're in that um, all that could be happening at the, at the same time. And obviously the power of seeing all those images of days of action of, of these large mobilizations in different places um, makes it different than, than that happening just by itself, um, even though that would be remarkable. Um, just quickly, is your, was your background, um, I'm asking you in particular as, uh, you said if you were, you were involved in organizing the, that, that first one, was your background um, as a, with, with organizations, as, a, as an organizer or a campaigner, um, did you come with a bunch of skills to, to organize such a, a day of action? Um, I would say that I've been a volunteer and a you know organizer uh, from secondary school, university, campus, and uh, with uh, civil society groups in Burundi. Uh, and then um, I joined 350 as a volunteer in 2009. And actually, the October 24th, the first GDA was my kind of um, yeah first big moment of organizing myself. So that time I was uh, I had just joined the staff uh, at 350. But I was also helping coordinating uh, this uh, um, organizing um, uh, of the GDA across uh, uh, across Africa. So uh, yes, I have that background, and that's kind of what led me to to join 350, and now um, as um, um, uh, one of the staff, uh, you know, continuing okay. pushing on this front. Yeah, thank you. I'm still there. Okay, thank you. Um, and so yeah, Mary Alice, you're. Um, yeah, I hope we have uh, some some good. Speaking of net, I think we we stress about the the quality of the internet for sessions like these, and probably underscores the whole reason we need uh, net neutrality and not to have these connections throttled. Um, where are we? Uh, I guess tell us. You're probably coming off of. I'm just thinking we were. We have headlines here in the U.S. about um, net neutrality fights picking up again. I'm curious if um, you have examples of. Any groups from California, which is at the spotlight right now, that have that are leaping back into action, or if you have any other other favorite examples of uh, of the volunteer network that you described? Sure. So yeah, as you mentioned, a bill just passed the California state legislature and was signed by the governor of California to support net neutrality protections for everyone living in the state of California. And there has been an active coalition of organizations working on that, including um, the Center for Media Justice, Fight for the Future, and many others that I can't name everyone here. So that's an exciting development. And I think it shows that politicians, especially in really large influential states like California, are feeling the heat on net neutrality and have been motivated and challenged and pressured to do something to make sure that we don't have online discrimination and that we have an open and free internet. Um, so that's been very exciting to see. And I actually want to rewind a little bit and go back mm -hmm. to an example that was really exciting for me as an organizer when we were really in the thick of the net neutrality and team internet organizing uh, in December 2017. Um, it became clear to us that the chair of the Federal Communications Commission was ready to vote to destroy the net neutrality rules that had previously been put on the books at the agency. So we had been well or into the time of our organizing. Team Internet was up and running. Thousands of volunteers were ready to work. And we put out a call for protests around the country at Verizon stores. And we chose Verizon partly because they have been active net neutrality opponents, but also because the FCC chair used to be a lawyer for Verizon. So there's a connection there. And we thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if a dozen protests happened? Well, 700 protests ended up happening on one single day in the middle of the winter on very short notice wow. all across the country. And they came in so fast and so um, quickly that it was, we had to really adjust on the back end to be able to approve and get those events up on a map fast enough so people could start spreading the word and RSVPing for them. So it was super exciting. And that day was such an inspiration because here in the US in December, it's dark. It's freezing cold in most places. And it, there's a lot going on, right? There's holidays, there's vacations, right. there's family time, there's schools. And people were just out in the streets everywhere, tens of thousands of people at all of these hundreds and hundreds of protests. And they were creative. They were um, bringing out holiday themed net neutrality carols. They were bringing out marching bands and drummers and they were just having so much fun and they were all self-organized. All we did was put out the call and say, hey, if you wanna sign up, 
we'll help you spread the word, throw your event up here on this map. And people answered that call. They were ready. Everybody was ready. And it was so fun and so inspiring to hmm. see. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'd love to actually just continue and, and start unpacking that a bit more and looking at the organizational um, dynamics that go into that. Um, first, I'm going to interrupt myself to just do a quick welcome to uh, seeing a number of uh, colleagues from uh, across the world joining here and just want to say a quick hello as I scan through the, the chat. We've got people from ActionAid and WeMove.eu and Friends of the Earth and Unitarian Universal Association all um, from, I don't know how many countries now joining. So, um, and sorry, I missed for, for the other dozens of you that I just missed. Um, if you're joining, we are, uh, we have a chat room going on in the middle, next to, somewhere next to or below the screen. Uh, I don't know which way to, to point here. Um, and would love to uh, say hi if, if you wanna put your name there and also take your questions. At there and at the hashtag mob lab live on Twitter. So self interruption ended and uh, back to uh, back to just back talking about team internet. So those those are, um, you know, and, and I should note that we probably have some folks who, as we're talking about this US event, and we, we do have a lot of folks from outside of the US. So as we mentioned, some of the commissioners and things, if, uh, hopefully someone will interrupt us if we need to unpack that further. But I think, you know, what we're here to talk about is the the organ organizing elements and you know I, I guess your free press is you know free press has been around for a bit you're you're fairly you're well established large organization I think it's it's fair to say um, and so you know was that unusual was that challenging to all of a sudden have a bunch of people presumably not all saying exactly the same thing in the streets what what led can you you know walk us back to the process where, um, you know, if this wasn't totally spontaneous, you know, what was the work? You said you had all these volunteers, of course, over time. So um, many organizations that I've run into don't invest in, don't necessarily have people with job descriptions like yours, or and aren't investing resources in that level of, I guess, engagement of asking people to become part of a, a team internet beyond, say, signing a petition to say if we support, um, you know, net neutrality, right? So. So what was, can you take us into some of those discussions behind the scenes? What, you know, how did you get from, yeah, we want people to sign up and of course stand with us and have a, long, a nice list of names and people in different congressional districts or political, key political areas into something where people were, um, in, you know, mobilized, empowered or encouraged to uh, go out in the streets? Yeah. So. As, as most of us know, the Trump administration has been attacking the people that we love and the issues we work on, certainly at Free Press, the communications issues that we work on and so many more that are important to folks in the states. So we knew that the Trump administration was coming for net neutrality. They wanted to get rid of it. Um, there was a quote from an um, important decision maker in Washington that said he wanted to take a weed whacker to net neutrality. So. We knew that we needed to go big, we needed to go bold, we needed to experiment, we needed to put everything we had behind this fight and do something new and experiment. And it really paid off. I'm really excited and glad that we did. We learned a lot from it. So the conversation in those days was really, um, what do we need to do? Where are we going? Where are the people coming from? Mm -hmm. um, in 2015, which was the year we secured the first set of net neutrality protections in Washington, it took 5 million people speaking out, including everyday people, activists, celebrities, on-air personalities, politicians. So our estimates were that we were going to need to double down and double that number and have closer to 10 million people speaking out. And that's really when the conversation led us to the need for partnership, partnering with our other allies and coalition mm -hmm. members and making sure that we could welcome in volunteers to work alongside us in the trenches. Because while we do have a, a staff here, um, we are really a relatively small staff, even when we put our three organizations together. So it was really important that we could increase our capacity and our ability to work strategically with volunteers. And 
maybe you could tick off some of the, um, you know, like what are some of the things then you, you, once you said that was, this is going to be an important, this is a priority for us. What are some of the sorts of things you did, the, um, you know, either trainings or toolkits or what, what were the sorts of things that you then did to, to from there? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned we can that get we, dirty on this, on this call about the, yeah, okay. that's the bolts okay. of distributed organizing. So, uh, I mentioned that we started Team Internet with this big online day of action, right? Mm -hmm. More than 250,000 websites participated. It generated more than 5 million emails to Congress in one day. The numbers were just astronomical. So we intentionally built in this field component, this volunteer component on the back end of that. And we asked people to volunteer mm -hmm. on that day of action. And so once we realized we had nearly half a million volunteers, we said, okay, we've got to contact them. First things first, right? Sure. So we began by using peer-to-peer -peer text messaging. We were using Relay hmm. and we started messaging everyone and we were inviting volunteers into that messaging process because as you can imagine, it took us about a month to text message all 500,000 people through around the clock volunteer shifts. Um, so we were text messaging people and they were being invited to an orientation phone call. And on that orientation call, there were mass calls where they could get updates about the status of the issue, the strategy for the campaign, and learn about how they could plug into the volunteer efforts. And we immediately asked people to sign up for a team of their choice. So we had different working groups or teams. Some were focused on calling volunteers. Some were, again, focused on those text messages. Some were focused on customer support, what we called our help desk, where volunteers were answering questions from other volunteers, uh, and so on and so forth. So once volunteers signed up for a team, they were then invited to smaller trainings with staff or with other volunteers so they could get the nuts and bolts of that team, get any training they needed. And we had a range of opportunities. So people could sign up for our text team and within five to 10 minutes be set up, be plugged in and ready to go with other volunteers. We also had much higher bars of entry for our customer service arm where volunteers were handling more sensitive information. They needed more um, direct training and a little bit more time from staff to really build trust, build a relationship and handle the sensitive information that they were working with. So is it, it's, is it fair to say that there were different role, that, that you had several clearly defined roles that people could sign up to and then it sounds like a whole bunch of follow on training or support for those particular roles. So if you're a team, so Team Internet was made up of many team, many smaller teams in which there were some certain clear roles. And could, and could you could you join as like a general member as well if you weren't yes. gonna, yeah. Yes, there are lots of different ways, different levels of participation. We welcomed mm -hmm. folks who could commit one hour per week to folks who were committing eight hours five days a week. And um, the, the thing that really astounded me was how much time the volunteers were willing to give, particularly when they were invited into leadership positions. So a volunteer could just be among the working group, as you mentioned, or they could step into a leadership position. So an example of that is in our Relay text messaging program. Volunteers had the opportunity to um, become moderators and help guide other volunteers through the process, help them make decisions, help them figure out how to answer um, questions that they might be receiving through text mm -hmm. messaging. And they could also, if they wanted to, help craft the campaign content. They could actually write the messages that were being sent. They could work in the back end of the Relay um, program so they could be doing some of that. The only thing in our text messaging program that we held closely because of our privacy policies was the list management and campaign creation on the back end because we didn't want to expose private data to volunteers, sure. for example. Sure. Um, it's funny you mentioned the customer service component of this. It's something that rang true for me as well, working on programs like this, where um, you know, I, you hesitate to use the word, and I understand why, because these are volunteers. And, and but the the relationship that um, I think I, I don't know if this will come out as a theme, or if uh, some of our other guests here have experienced the same. But when we have um, volunteers doing such intensive, unpaid, or you know, volunteer work, um, the you know there is, and and in a culture where we can get instant responses from other organizations and institutions. There is that interesting kind of expect high level expectation that, that I've certainly seen that you're describing where um, a, a local leader or volunteer is expecting a certain level of 
um, reliable support or responsiveness from an organization, which does, you know, can be almost best described as like really good customer service in, in any other context, even though we're obviously in a in a nonprofit and social impact sector where we don't necessarily have customers, but that that that, that equivalent does feel that does certainly of relationship expectation, I guess, uh, rings true for me as well. And I'd be curious if that's showing up for um, at 350 and, and beyond the bomb groups as well. Um, if you want just last question here, uh, the, what is the nature now? I mean, obviously the legislative fights, the um, have come and gone in different ways and the and um, regulation, federal regulations and whatnot. So what what's the nature of, of Team Internet now? Because you were talking about obviously the peak of, mm -hmm. a peak act level of activity being last year. Um, what's, how have you been able to sustain or what are the challenges around sustaining momentum um, for these groups? Yeah, so we achieved more than we ever thought we could through Team Internet, um, which includes everything from that big day of action to engaging these thousands of volunteers to passing a piece of legislation through the Senate that everyone said we could not achieve and that that would be impossible. So we kept achieving, kept getting results, kept having an impact, and it was incredible. And ultimately, the, the net neutrality protections were taken off the books. So we did have a loss there, which wasn't unsurprising or unsuspected. It was a, um, a steep hill to victory there for us. So we are in um, a bit of a, an ebb, I like to say. You know how campaigns mm -hmm. have peaks and valleys, um, and sometimes those valleys come after a loss. And so that is where we're at right now. Um, it's not all a valley though, right? Because you mentioned that net neutrality uh, law that was just passed in California. We are actively engaged in a court case and a lawsuit to restore the net neutrality protections. And there's certainly more work to be done. So all is not lost, but sure. it is quieter now. It is harder to keep volunteers engaged when the work slows down, when there's less of an immediate threat, and when there are so many other very important issues here in the states that uh, need a, need to be addressed under the Trump administration. Well, maybe that's a good a good question and good segue for laundry as well. Um, Ten years, you know, is a long time to be fighting for anything, really. Um, obviously, even if it's our future and our planet, um, it's 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 a it's more than worthwhile, in my opinion. Um, whatever it takes. But how are you? Uh, how are you sustaining, you know, how, yeah, I, I guess not just for yourself, obviously, but I guess amongst groups uh, that you're trying to keep engaged and working with, um, how do you think about that sustained, um, sustained momentum? And, and, you know, and as part of that, I'm just curious what's changed over time too in that, in that 10 years, because you've, um, I think if I recall correctly, you started as a well, as a call out, an idea for a day of action, not asking people to start groups, right? But today's is like, let's do this one thing. And now 10 years later, uh, you have 350 groups or chapters. Um, yeah, tell us more about the evolution and how, um, is it the same group of people over the last 10 years or is it, has there been a lot of transition and uh, churn in, the, in those local local efforts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, over the 10 years, there have been a lot of changes and also transitions um, to be where we are at the moment. Uh, first of all, I would say that normally the um, uh, GDA or Global Days of Action, or sometimes Regional Days of Action, uh, represent the first step into distributed organizing, right? That's the, yeah, the first opportunity that which is there, uh, shared over, over internet, email lists, inviting people to come and join and you know uh, be part of a global or regional organizing uh, moment so afterward what happened after this big mobilization um uh, those who normally took part are contacted by the staff essentially what we call internally uh, the feed organizers uh, they are contacted to follow up right to ensure that this uh, their effort and the momentum is sustained uh also uh we try to locate those who are um, in one, you know, in the same district or regions or province or city. So we inc to encourage them to meet up on mm. a regular basis and, and brainstorm okay. on what sort of long-term kind of action or campaign they would like to, to work on or to focus on basically. So we don't want, we try as much as we can not to lose uh, this momentum and those people who attend uh, this uh, big mobilization day. So we also uh, offer kind of one-on-one coaching 
and advice to mm. those groups that are willing uh, to continue um, uh, working on some sort of, uh, some sort of long-term uh, action and, and campaign uh, to on weekly basis or by weekly basis to support them uh, to get to know what their ideas uh, are and what they would like to kind of to start on as first step and also what are the objectives what are the uh, what the needs are and we try as much as we can to um, to support uh, through training uh, strategic planning and sometimes we move to specific locations uh, to work with those groups uh, to develop yeah. kind of long-term uh, strategic campaigns. Uh, so, for instance, like two weeks ago, I was in Accra, Ghana, mm -hmm. working with a group uh, which has been with us for the last six, six years or so. Uh, this is a group which managed to um, stop or push back the first coal plant that was meant to be installed in Ghana uh, three yeah. years ago. Now the yeah. group, uh, after that kind of yeah, big win and victory, has transitioned into a renewable energy campaign uh, for communities, which is being implemented right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they've completed the first phase last year. Now we were working with them two weeks ago to develop uh, the second phase where they would like to be more uh, targeted into uh, at the city level, uh, the, the Accra, which is the capital of, of Ghana. So uh, I would say, uh, kind of in summary, that over the 10 years, there have been a lot of changes and transitioning. We moved from... Uh, big moment, though we still use them, trying to uh, um, uh, rather focus more on strategic campaigns where there is, um, uh, and also in key locations, uh, being uh, focused, uh, develop some strategic campaigns in specific locations that are likely to show some sort of rap rapid result and tangible in impact. Uh, that's where we are at the moment, though we still accommodate and involve and invite uh, more group to join, but to trend to uh, you know uh, spend uh, a large amount of our time and our effort in some uh, specific locations that are likely to show uh, immediate results or uh, yeah some sort of tangible impact. I, one of you you mentioned. Um, I mean, you're in so many different locations. At, so one question that that's come in, and I'm curious how this plays into your training and support. But for groups that are in in places with clo very closed. Uh, in, in closed democratic spaces or limited ability, limited free speech zones, and um, where you know where it's not safe, where public mobilization is not uh, is not particularly safe. Where how do you what what have you seen um, either in your most recent campaigns or in the training um, that that those of us might be able to learn from outside of yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, we trend to be um, you know safety of our volunteers and uh, organizers is a paramount at 350. So we take that into consideration as we engage them into, into campaigning. And we try to avoid any sort of risky action, direct okay. action, massive, yeah. um, yeah. etc. But rather encourage them to look at some of the actions that are kind of light or not too risky. Uh, so we introduce um, um, a, a tactic called activism. Uh, it's basically activism using art. Uh, mm. when you know we can uh, use chant songs poetry pieces of theater to still convey the message and uh, you know reach the target using some sort of soft tactics that are not seen as confrontational or risky for the organizers in some of the closed spaces or countries where we know that our activists will be in danger if ever they go out and you know public protest of that so we've been uh, we work with them through the 101 coaching that I said uh, to you know to, to discuss and assess what sort of uh, form of, of tactic of mobilization do you think can work well in your community right. what is safe what is not safe what works what doesn't work and also try to tell the form of um, um, tactic based on safety but also what works at, in local context mm. Mm. that's helpful thank you um, it strikes me that so much of your staff at 350 is dedicated to supporting groups everywhere. If not, but I don't know if it would even be a majority. Um, that that stands in contrast to, as I listed through a number of the organizations who are joining this call. Mo you know, most most of the, I think it's fair to say, most NGOs who are investing in this kind of work, um, only one, you know, a small percentage of staff may be dedicated towards distributed organizing, um, distributed volunteer work. 
if you were to advise one of those groups based on your experience, what are some of the, when it comes to the training and capacity building or support that you have invested so deeply in and, you know, when you're off in Ghana working with a group there, like you said, what, what, are, what would you advise as some of the, the most important things for a group just getting into this kind of work to keep in mind when it comes to that, those resources or investing in, in, in supporting those groups? Yeah, uh, maybe before answering the question, I'll mention that we, yes, uh, maybe uh, out there globally, we seem to be like a huge team of 150 so staff members. Uh -huh. But for instance, in Africa, we are very small team. <laughs> it doesn't feel like 150. Yeah, no, at all. I think we are seven, eight, and we cover a continent which has got 54 countries, 55 countries, right. different languages, different uh, you know contexts, different realities, so that we have to deal with. So uh, basically, what we do is we try to prioritize. Yeah, mm. prioritization is the key. and also working um, um, uh, smarter. Not hard, you know. Not harder is another another key, and also um, having some sort of um, assessment of mapping or mapping where there is potential or possibility uh, to get an impact, which eventually can uh, kind of um, send out in the neighboring countries or you know per regions mm -hmm. uh, some positive vibe that can encourage and um, motivate others to replicate the model. So for instance, to give you a quick example, in Africa, sure. we work with some priority countries. Uh, we have South Africa in the southern part. We've got Kenya in the eastern part. We've got uh, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, and Senegal in the western part. So that's how we actually we try, we try to um, uh, distribute geographically our areas of focus. So by uh, focusing on those uh, regions, Providing this kind of uh, more more or less uh, intensive uh, training and support and coaching, we can get some sort of wins and uh, and progress, which can stimulate and motivate neighboring countries in those um, sub regions that I may have mentioned. So prioritizing is one. Yeah. Um, mapping is the second, and also you know uh, measure the uh, kind of the type of investment that would like to do, and also be able to deepen the structure and open up for new uh, leadership opportunities for volunteers. Because uh, we've seen also, um, you know, over the years of, of work that, you know, some volunteers really uh, show a, a kind of a long-term commitment into organizing and distributing. And also we have to create kind of structures that uh, allow this kind of, uh, you know, um, new leadership to emerge. Uh, and uh, this can help us actually continue building uh, the, this community of all organizers and volunteers in the regions or the sub regions where they are based. Those are some That's of the examples. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I like the, uh, the dichotomy of both. It sounds like making sure there's room for leadership to emerge everywhere and that you're supporting mm -hmm. anyone anywhere who wants to step up, but also having a strategic layer on top of that because you have limited resources for support. There's only so many of you, even with. If you even if you get a big new grant, there would still be not enough staff people to cover every location and country. And so, um, yeah, maybe we can go. And that, that sounds like that that kind of strategic overlay may also be true for. Our, in our, I'll look for some nods or of, or disagreement, I guess, from uh, from Cecily and Mary Alice, if that's true. Just in terms of political thinking about political districts and certain kinds of events, I presume from what I understand from hearing your stories that there is some uh, need to focus limited resources in, in certain areas, um, even though you're supporting everyone everywhere at the same time. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe we can, let's, I wanna make sure we uh, jump to Cecily here and before we jump to some other questions and um, thank you for, I know we were messing with your, with your audio, but uh, uh, the, I, I guess, you know, you, your your background, if it's okay to reveal, uh, it I know is coming from a one of these larger organizations, right? Uh, that um, you know maybe had a bigger email list, and um, you know what you're doing with Beyond the Bomb, I think didn't necessarily start with say a um, you know like in Mary Alice's example, there was this this great moment where all of a sudden the surge of volunteers. I also got the benefit in my own experience of this kind of surge of media moment where people could then swarm to the internet and say, "What can I do?" Seems like you have a different scenario, right? Where instead of working with a giant email list already, you're starting from scratch. Uh, and um, tell us a bit about, I guess, the what you notice. What are some of the challenges 
you've learned to overcome or had to overcome or that you would share with others about get it starting up, starting an initiative kind of from, from, from zero and yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I think the main thing at the moment is that we're trying to create that moment, right? Like it, it exists to a certain extent and we have to um, catalyze it and, and define it and really make it more of an opportunity than it, it maybe actually is. Um, our, our approach to that, and I think that this is, I, I, the way that I think about volunteer engagement and, and all the pieces that everyone else has spoken about is that we are basically running professional development for the movement, right? For progressive, for the progressive future. Um, and that's every organization that's doing this work is, is doing that. And so we approach what we're doing from that perspective. What are the skills? What are the, the knowledge that we're going to need these folks to have five, 10, 15 years down the road when we hopefully will find that some of them are running this, this work? Um, and so we we think about it from that perspective, and I think that that's an opportunity for us to engage people who might not otherwise step into this work. Is that there's a clear benefit beyond you know you're going to create change, and that's great. You're also going to learn skills. You're going to you're going to understand how campaigning works. You're going to get an opportunity um, to build up your knowledge so that you can be a better um, agent for good going forward. Um, so we look at a variety of things, right? We we take kind of professional development theory into account. We think about how do people learn? What are all the different ways in which people learn? And, and it varies, particularly when they're remote, right? So whether it's a webinar like this, or we need to do online toolkits, or we have peer groups where people can, can gather and share ideas, that customer service model, um, setting up each of those kinds of avenues so that no matter how you learn the work, there's a way to do that. So that's one piece. And then I think the other piece for us is really important we are all of our organizing is built of this patient all of campaigning large so we take those those values of um you know equity leadership trust and we apply those into both the campaigning that we're doing how we prioritize the work but also the way in which we do the work and the, really importantly the way in which we engage people so that comes back to how we approach you know, someone's leadership, they're not always going to do something that, you know, we want them to do. Sometimes when you're doing distributed organizing, you have folks who are off message or off strategy. Um, so our kind of general approach to that is we get out of it what we put into it. And we are the, the bottom line for, for responsibility and accountability. We have, to be, we have to have enough trust in our training, our knowledge sharing, and our articulation of the strategy and, and the sort of high, high level campaign strategy um, we have to have enough trust in that, that when people then take that and activate it in their own communities or in their own ways, we're confident that it's going to work. And if it doesn't, then we assess it, we look at it, we review it, and we revise. Um, but that comes back to us, not to our activists. Their, you know, th their accountability is really to engage in, in the opportunities we give them. So I guess what would you say, I said it's such an interesting point, and you know, again, in contrast to a legacy institution or a more, you know, an organization that's built up advocacy and legislative units and, you know, has various lobbying elements. You know, I, I can just hear that, <laughs> that director coming to you and saying like, how could you let this person in whatever district tell that representative that this is our position when clearly it was that other sentence that's not that our position and everything, you know, and every everything's going to hell, what are we going to do? Um, you know, I'm only even, not even exaggerating that much, I guess. What, uh, for a lot of scenarios, like what, you're saying it's on you, I guess, tell us more about how you handle the, this, you know, this idea of letting go and, or investing trust in, in people and that is, and it sounds like it's work for you, but I guess, what, what do you tell, maybe at the, at the question is, what would you tell those who are particularly nervous about the model that you've just described you know yeah yeah absolutely so i mean I, I you alluded to this i came from one of those very huge nonprofits. i spent a lot of time um working in one of those uh what i call the like 60-year nonprofits. They, they're the behemoths that have been around a really long time um and i started as a volunteer and so i actually am the product of this distributed organizing and and that professional development that i received as a volunteer allowed me to get where i am in terms of my, my skill now um, so, and, and then as you said, now I've seen it from the other side and, and I'm working at a much scrappier operation, which has the, 
disadvantage of, of fewer resources and the advantage of significantly more freedom of decision making. And, and we can kind of operate um, more stealthily around these kinds of questions. I think ultimately for me, this comes down to you're, this is not easier, obviously. It is harder work as a campaigner for your staff. It is harder to do this kind of organizing, but the payoff is significantly bigger, which is to say your organizers and your campaigners have to put the time and the effort and the resources into fully understanding your issue and how it looks on the ground, fully understanding the skill sets necessary to get the work done and fully understanding how to articulate those things to your activists and to your folks who are doing the work. Um, and then not just yeah. letting it go, it's, you know, distributed organizing isn't like, okay, I'm going to throw all this stuff to you and, and see how you do. You have to stay there. You have to continue to be present and to be a participant in that process. Um, but you have to do that with trust and respect. Um, and so I think, I think what I would say is, you know, the, the payoff can be significantly larger if you can hold back your your control freak nature which i think all of us as campaigners have a tendency toward we want to control as many variables as possible right um, but if you can hold off from that and you can take that deep breath and you can find a way to either collaborate with those folks in the ground or you know at the end of the day if you have people who are loose cannons who who aren't really working cut them loose it's okay it's okay to say you know what we, we appreciate your effort but but what you're doing there is not really working for us um, but you have to you have to be on it on a daily basis and really be tracking what's happening and and give people the benefit of the doubt. I wonder if any of the other this is such a hot topic. Always this is always a hot question in this in this for this conversation. I'm just curious if any of the others want to chime in on this this question of of trust and letting go and and consistency across. You know what is the value of I guess kind of consi yeah consistency. Um, this question has come up from in the chat and and in, in the RSVP is a few different ways. Um, any quick thoughts from, uh, yeah, Mary Alice or Lundry? I can just say that I would kind of plus one everything that Cecily was saying and that so many of us are so used to campaigning, organizing, doing our digital work, doing our field work, where the work evolves around us. And it does take a change in our mindset and a change in approach to the way that we're doing our work to let go, to make direct ask, to build in accountability measures, to build trust, to do the distributed work that is so powerful and has that big payoff. And it's totally worth it. And it is hard <laughs> and yeah. um, challenging. And it really, it's really worth it to let go, to make that leap of faith in terms of trust and to change our orientation and the way that we do our work. So um, also echoing what uh, Marie, Alice, and Cecily say, that uh, that sort of flexibility help. Uh, flexibility uh, helps when doing this sort of campaign, knowing that sometimes though we build trust and we trust uh, the, the local group and volunteers, sometimes there are some disappointment or some un unexpected event that uh, leads to changing the whole strategy, uh, the whole plan. So um, I think flexibility on the on the um, on the context. And also uh, knowing that we, you know, we are humans, and sometimes there are mistakes or disappointment, but ready right. to, uh, yeah, keep moving with those who are moving who are still eager uh, to make the change. Cool. Yeah, I know. And it sounds sounds like yeah, there's that that cost benefit analysis where there, there may you're all saying that you know there may be some things that don't work out as expected, but in, in the scheme of things, those are minor compared to the overwhelming benefits that you're all seeing. Um, We'll just do maybe another lightning round here be, before we close. I, a few questions on just about scaling, I think, both the, in the training, capacity building, and just um, as well as, I think, the work itself. So from, from a few different people. So I'm curious, any, any quick reflections from any of you? In your, and we don't have to go all the way around, but on how to think about uh, scaling, because this is so different, obviously, than the one-to-one -one, the local community organizing where you can spend all the time, you know, more time with more people in, in person. So I'll just really quickly say we use a snowflake model that essentially has, uh, we have action core leaders, which, um, you know, they're, they're uh, hubs, and then mm -hmm. each, of the, each of the action core leaders uh, works with one or more um, chapters, and then the chapters, you know, are engaged in that community, and so that, that disperses our um, our time, right? Like it gives us the ability for, I only have two organizers. We, you know, we're really scrappy. We're covering the, the whole country. So the two organizers are, are awesome, but they're just two of them. 
Um, so they each have action core leaders that they meet with regularly and that they train. And then those folks are doing the organizing of the chapters. And then the chapters are engaging and organizing at their community level. So you have to, you have to kind of set up a model that you can replicate over and over. And that to me is the best way to scale, right? Because then once you have that model set up, you're literally just setting it up elsewhere and details are gonna be different, realities on the ground are different in different locations, but that allows you to, um, to not have to reinvent the wheel each time. Great. I can build on that and I'll try and hit a different point. Um, so one thing that I help, think helps with team internet success is using tech tools and platforms that are pretty widely available and easy to use and don't take a lot of setup or tech savvy and skill to use. So relay text messaging, Slack mm. as kind of a mm -hmm. virtual office and chat room, um, mass call platforms like Zoom and Maestro Conference that are really easy for volunteers to dial in, even if they've never been on a webinar like this before or a phone call with hundreds of other people before, they can still participate and not have a big barrier to their entry. That's great. I think the, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, the big organizing book that, uh, Zach Axley and Becky Vaughn recently published uh, backs up some of your points there on using freely available large scale tools to, to our advantage. Um, I'm just realizing we are at time. I could chat with you guys for hours about, about this and, um, and hopefully we'll have opportunities to in the future. Um, but for the moment, while we still have people here and about to sign off, I just want to say a very big uh, thank you and appreciation for sharing your experiences with us. I know there's more that you haven't, that you didn't get a chance to share and there's great links and resources. Um, we are gonna, for those listening, um, we are, and always after these sessions, round up links and additional points and takeaways uh, that were made and that weren't made in a summary post. So look out for that um, with with big appreciation to also to a project of who, helps make this whole program happen and gets us all here in the same place and obviously hosts many of these herself. Um, so with that, I am going to say a, uh, a very abrupt farewell to everyone and, and thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to, as, as I know many others have other things scheduled at this time, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone on our next uh, Mob Lab Live conversation. So until then, thank you. And goodbye. Bye. Thank Have you. Have a great rest of your day.